Our conversation this week is with Jaron James, and Jaron is the chief operating officer and co-founder of Food Rocket. And Food Rocket is a food delivery service that is currently in San Francisco with plans to take uh, to go into many different cities across the United States. And their unique proposition is food delivery, fresh groceries, vegetables, and anything you can find out at a grocery store in 15 minutes, which is a big change from the current paradigm of food delivery services. We talk about logistics, we talk about last mile delivery, and we talk about why San Francisco is such a difficult place for a food delivery startup. Let's jump right in to this week's episode of the LA Business Podcast. Welcome to the LA Business Podcast, your destination to hear stories of how businesses grow and scale. I'm Robert Brill, CEO of Brill Media and the host of this podcast. Now, let's jump right into this week's interview. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the LA Business Podcast. Today our guest is Jaron James, Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Food Rocket. And Food Rocket is San Francisco's first 15-minute grocery grocery delivery service. Jaron, thanks for being on the show today. Tell us a little bit about Food Rocket and how you came to be a co-founder for this company. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, so uh, uh, you know, I was always excited about the last mile space, and I uh, always wanted to, you know, do uh, uh, create a better last mile service for the consumer. It's always having the consumer's needs in mind, and um, you know, I, I come from a background with, uh, you know, in a background of operations from Amazon. I used to run fulfillment center operations at Amazon, and then moved on to uh, do the same thing for Groupon, and then moved on to head of global logistics at Facebook. And working at all these big giants, what I was truly missing was the startup atmosphere of creating something from the ground up that I really wanted to be a part of. And I so immersed myself in the space that I really was excited about, which was picking up speed. And uh, it was the last mile space. And, uh, you know, what Food Rocket's offering is, is completely unique. It's completely different than any other offering that you have out there. It's a guarantee of delivery within 10 to 15 minutes of your um, of your groceries to your doorstep. So it's absolutely amazing uh, uh, to see, the to create the entire operation behind the scene of how we can make this happen with the logistics, with the warehousing, with the tools, with the technology available today at our disposal. Um, it's absolutely amazing. So that's exciting to me. And uh, that's why I'm, a, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity. So Jaron, there's, there's a lot of places to go with that. So my, my first question is, I imagine that you launch in San Francisco because it's a condensed area. I imagine uh, Manhattan would be another place where you can gain a lot of traction. I imagine Los Angeles will have a, a fair bit of difficulty in the broader LA area. You know, maybe in parts of Santa Monica or downtown, you might have some traction. Tell us a little bit about why you chose San Francisco. Tell us a little bit about the logistics of last mile delivery. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you if you look at uh, most most uh, businesses, they start to start uh, in the easiest market that they can start at. And uh, we want to take a different approach. We wanted to go to the most toughest market. <laughs> okay. And San Francisco is the toughest market to start at, and especially when you want to do something like grocery delivery. Um, and so, uh, so we wanted to explore this option. We wanted to basically have a playbook completely standardized before we expand. And uh, what better to do that than the toughest market uh, for, for us? So why, is that, in why is that? Sorry, J Jaren, why is SF hard? A uh, lot of regulations, lot of, uh, a lot of permitting requirements and uh, things that you have to kind of navigate through. Things take time to establish, like even uh, getting a single permit takes weeks, uh, sometimes months. Uh, so, so we need to really get uh, an understanding of where we can actually locate a facility for us uh, and then also figure out how the permitting rules and regulations are so that we can you know, ensure that we are following everything to the T and being 100% compliant. So, so that's the challenge here. Uh, from a scaling standpoint, we definitely are looking at the LA market, just as you mentioned. Uh, we're looking at uh, Chicago. We're looking at you know expanding from the uh, uh, the west to the east. You know, so so we definitely are currently we're focused on San Francisco. We opened up uh, uh, some locations here. We are planning to open up LA. We're opening up. Uh, we're also thinking of about opening in Chicago pretty soon. Uh, and there's definitely Philadelphia, Boston, New York. All of them are in the pipeline. Yes. So tell us about last mile logistics. Um, you know, we in our household we use Instacart, and um, I, I would love to have uh, chocolate delivered to my doorstep in fifteen minutes. That might come ha yeah. in handy in a pinch. What goes into the mechanics of that, and and, and tell us about what makes it so difficult? Because it sounds like it's very difficult to pull off 
at scale. Absolutely. So, uh, so when you think about last mile space, the last mile space is me is is a very unique space where the biggest cost for uh, anybody in logistics happens in the last mile. Almost thirty to forty percent of your cost is completely just last mile. So, uh, focusing and solving this challenge here by using uh, you know state of the art technology uh, behind the scenes, the logic and the engineering aspects that goes into you know creating a much more optimized approach of you know picking your orders and packing each packaging orders and delivering your orders uh, you know using uh, you know uh, you know innovative methods of delivering like e-bikes and e-scooters you know instead of traditional traditional methods that we we usually see which is you know somebody's coming and picking up on a uh, and taking in their car and delivering to your doorsteps and when in condensed markets we we see uh, uh, we can really be eco-friendly at the same time we will be able to deliver that much more faster because we don't have to uh, you know wait for a traffic signal or a light uh, we can uh, navigate the street it's much more faster than uh, than a than a vehicle can. So, um, so so that way, you know, thinking about the entire technology, right from the time the order is placed till the time the order is at the doorstep of the consumer, uh, you know, we we have our metrics that we track. We call it click to eat. You know, so you literally click the order, and and it needs to be available to you to eat within the within 15 minutes. And uh, you know, we're averaging around seven minutes uh, right now for delivery, uh, and and it's absolutely amazing seeing the experience. We pick the order within two to three minutes. That's the whole thing. How quickly can you pick the order? How optimized is your warehouse and your and your fulfillment center that you can really pick the order fast and get it to your driver, and the driver is literally ready to go and zooming to the location and delivering within I'm imagining I'm imagining like a bunch of really fit like young people like you know how like in races (laughs) they're like knelt down they're ready to run yeah (laughs) I'm imagining that ready to go like dash supermarket sweep dash for the for the for the shelf and be on their way um so that's really interesting. Why yeah. why did you decide to take on this? I mean, look, your your logistics chops is second to none. How why did you choose to take on this challenge among the myriad of last mile challenges that might exist? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think uh, from a uh, grocery something that everybody needs on a day-to-day basis, right? And uh, when you think about, hey, I need my daily essentials, I need my breakfast, and I, I know, I now I need to, you know, if you if you think about the entire traditional grocery experience, you know, it takes forever to get out there, almost spending two to three hours sometimes buying things in bulk, uh, you know, bringing to your uh, to your house and storing them in fr- refrigerators and freezers, and sometimes needing another one to just store excess. So so what we what we thought about was why. Why are consumers, uh, you know, why are the consumers having all of this? problems and all this time uh, you know being spent on doing this how can we make this much more easier where you don't need a fridge you don't need an extra fridge you don't need to order and store it in bulk just because you don't have the time you have us at the click of your fingertips and you can literally get up in the morning and be like okay I need this something for breakfast okay food rocket you know uh, selecting the item and literally by the time you just you know take a shower come back come out your, your breakfast that's your doorstep so so that that seemed like a very interesting problem to solve where now we're solving storage issues we're so, we Solve, we are eco friendly, we are delivering just in time, and uh, you know, there's no scheduling. You know, if you look at all the competitors out there, you have to schedule it. You also have a delivery fee. We don't have a delivery fee, we don't, we don't have to schedule. You just order just in time at where you want it, and we'll deliver it if you're in our radius. And uh, and uh, there's no uh, delivery minimums, there's no order minimums. So it's absolutely wow. amazing for the consumer. So, solving all of those challenges where you have to pay all these extra money and wait for a scheduled time. That to be a first of all available to the consumer uh, when they're placing the order, and then you know waiting until that time to actually you know receive what you've ordered uh, is a, is a problem. And I, I felt that was really something that we wanted to solve. Do you? I mean, so are you? Are your people going to local local stores to pick up the product? If I want like a a Kit Kat or something, are you going to like the nearest bodega to find it, or like do you have your fulfillment warehouses? How does that set up? That's right. So, so we we have our fulfillment warehouses. We we don't go to any other store right now. Uh, we will be once we set up our entire infrastructure. The idea is, of course, to expand and include all of the pieces of logistics as well. Even you know we can be your delivery point. You know we're already delivering groceries to your door. Why not deliver everything else for you, right? So that is definitely going to be coming down the pipeline. I think our first step right now is to ensure that we are able to deliver groceries from our micro fulfillment centers uh, directly to your doorstep. And so we have the products. It's it is. 
in our micro fulfillment centers. We don't have to go anywhere else. We pick in in a very optimized fashion and we deliver it to your doorstep uh, very very quickly and efficiently. And how do you? What's the economic model there? How do, how do you how do you become a massive company on what? Like how do you make money? Yeah, so I think as we scale, like you said, you know, uh, we uh, uh, we definitely have our, our margins just like any other ret- retailer, right? So the, it's just like it's 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 a grocery delivery service that basically also takes into consideration the the category management and making sure that you have the inventory as well. So we're managing the inventory as well. Versus if you look at traditional delivery services, they don't manage any of the inventory. All they do is pick up and drop off, right? So we we manage the inventory. We, we are the ones at scale, at, you know, leveraging economies of scale with our suppliers to get the products at, at really good value to the consumer. So we can still offer the, uh, the price similar to any retail gross, grocery store, local grocery store, uh, to the consumer, have no extra charge on it, and be able to deliver it just because we are so optimized in everything that we do. Wow. So, so tell us a little bit about your experiences with Amazon and Facebook. What is what, you know? I, I understand the advertising business. I understand data. I understand how people, the algorithm may make decisions about the types of ads and content people see at Facebook. What does mm-hmm. logistics in the world of Facebook look like? Yeah, so I mean that's a very good question, uh, and it's a question that a lot of people ask me when when I say I was running global logistics at Facebook. So Facebook has a lot of infrastructure behind the scenes that Facebook has to set up to basically be serving uh, the 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 all the consumers and having access to their platform, right? So there's a lot of different things. Like for example, you uh, you know you've got all the data centers, every single every single equipment that needs to go into a data center to basically bring the data center live, um, you know, all the equipment that goes into the AVPC capabilities in every single office in Facebook, all the equipment that goes into the IT equipment that goes into uh, all the employees' hands. Uh, we also have events that Facebook runs globally. All the inventory that's basically bought globally to run these events, um, you know, F8 event that Facebook runs and so on and so forth. Um, you know, security gear, because we have, you know, we, we have the largest, uh, uh, you know, pool of consumer data. Uh, we have to be very secure in our data centers and, and our offices as well, you know, because we want to make sure that that's completely 100% secure. So we've got system security equipment that also needs to be, uh, you know, set up and and procured from different in, for different part different offices, different parts of the world. So the entire aspect of uh, you know, sourcing, procuring, inventory management, trans, uh, uh, transportation, reverse logistics, even things that have now now out of life, end of life, and they're going to be, you know, put back into either, you know, refurbished and reused inside the same ecosystem or donated to the to the cities and schools now because, hey, this is actually just a two-year-old equipment, but we just have high standards. So we want to make sure that they, they could, the consumer's uh, data is using the latest and greatest gear. And so all of this equipment can be reused and repurposed. So we actually donate to the cities and the schools um, and that's how that's how that's what we did. So the end for the entire global uh, Facebook offices and data centers, we managed all the equipment that goes in and out, including telecom equipment, hardwares, anything that went into R and D facilities, um, and it, even the acquisitions that we have, like Oculus and Facebook, uh, the Oculus and WhatsApp that were acquired. You know, things things for them, right? Um, uh, was managed. If you go into a Facebook office, you'll see multiple floors have uh, a vending machine. And those vending machines have all sorts of IT equipment in there that people can just literally swap their badge and get it. So we've we've made it to a we've got it to a point where if an employee needs something, all they have to do is scan a badge of the vending machine and take it out. So so setting up the entire accessory infrastructure as well across all Facebook offices, supporting Facebook employees, Facebook data centers, uh, that's and, and all the other acquisitions that Facebook does. That's what logistics truly means. And coming out of the uh, the COVID nineteen coronavirus pandemic, um, I imagine there have been some significant changes in how logistic plays out or plans out for the future. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I've definitely heard a lot of interesting stories about how um, uh, medicine ha- isn't available if it's manufactured overseas. Tell us a little bit about the changes you expect to see in logistics and, and, and procurement over the next five years as a result of, of the last year and a half that we've just lived through. Yeah, absolutely. So as you as you as you know, a lot of the foot traffic in a lot of lot of malls, a lot of lot of locations have definitely reduced. People have you know started using e-commerce platforms or applications that are readily available for them to order stuff to, to be delivered to their doorstep. And people who've never tried this before have also started trying this. So once people get used to this platform, this convenience, this speed, uh, what what we're seeing in the last mile space is that you know that is going to grow consistently. If you just see 
2020, right after March till May, there was a big boom in last mile. Every single company that was basically in last mile was growing, you know, at the rate of 10x, right? 5x, 10x, you know, sometimes more than that. Um, people that were not in last mile wanted to get into last mile. So, so they, they, they sprung up their, uh, their last mile capabilities of delivering to the consumer to the end. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. It's, gonna, it's a very important piece of, the, uh, of uh, you know, of, you know, basically ensuring that we're servicing the customers. Uh, it's true customer obsession is solving big challenges for the customer. And this is here to stay. So, so last mile space is definitely going to keep on increasing. Um, you know, we might see, uh, you know, increased food traffic as things get back to normal. But uh, still, people, once they get used to the service and the service is exceptional, uh, they tend to stick on, just like how it happened with Amazon back in the day, right? Now everybody expects prime two-day shipping. So, yeah. Do you, um, I mean, is, there, is this a, a, um, an opportunity with Food Rocket to, so, so as the world goes towards, uh, immediate delivery, right? We, we, mm -hmm. we, we've all heard that Amazon is really interested in delivering products within hours, not days. Um, and they're testing that out in certain markets. Is, yeah. is Food Rocket an opportunity to capitalize on that consumer behavior because people are going to expect that with food? Do you have, do you yeah. envision going into other uh, related industries, uh, not delivering food, but delivering products in, in, uh, to local areas? Tell us about the, the future of Food Rocket. Absolutely. So, so uh, we start with groceries, which is the most difficult space to actually cap, uh, you know, conquer. So once you once you establish all your micro fulfillment centers across all of the nation, you know, you already have a logistics service that's going to every doorstep. Right. Once you have that, you can definitely, you know, use that logistic services for, for pretty much any anything that, that's out there. So we can partner with Amazon. We can partner with Walmart. We can partner with different people to provide the last miles, uh, you know, logistic services for them. You know, we, we they literally all they have to do is get 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 it delivered to one of our stores and we do all the last miles for them. Right. So they've built out their old last mile space. But I think, you know, once you have a footprint readily available across the nation, we can we can do a much better job and much much more efficiently and economically with leveraging economies of scale. So, so that's going to be the, the true uh, future of Food Rocket, where we will do a lot more than just groceries uh, and, of course, package delivery, all of that stuff. So when you think about your, your work as a co-founder of this company, what, what do you do to co-found this type of company? Like, what's, what's, what does day one look like? I know what day <laughs> one for my business look like, right? It's like, okay, now i got to get customers, and i got to know right. how to do ad buys on, on these platforms. Yeah. What does day one, day two, day 10, you know, the first year look like for Food Rocket? Because, I mean, are you going out and delivering food? Are you worried? Are you trying to get partnerships? Like, yeah. What do you focus on? Absolutely. So, so day one, day one for us doesn't happen until we we are ready with our infrastructure. We kind of put everything together. We have a playbook that we have to make sure that everything is ready to go until day one. Day one we call as the the day we go live, right? And when we go live, you know, the first orders are delivered by the executives. I am delivering the first order. I actually delivered to a lot of consumers and understood the challenges, you know, firsthand, so that we can go back and re reiterate the model and figure things out, uh, and and fix it for the consumer, right? So true customer obsession. One of the biggest principles of a food rocket is true customer obsession and what that means is we want to make sure that customer is getting everything that they want and more out of out of any service that they basically take out of food rocket so so getting the feedback is extremely important so every delivery service that we do we capture that feedback and that's extremely important goes back into our uh, you know our okrs and metrics that we track uh, so that we can constantly improve improve our platform so so setting up a setting up a, a service like this is is literally uh, a lot of work behind the scenes you know making it super easy and convenient for the customer. So in three clicks, completing the entire uh, ordering process for them. And we are, uh, you know, basically using all our learnings and all our experience to deliver it to the consumer at uh, a much more efficient, faster way that anybody has done before. So now I understand, um, in fact, last month, uh, news in the Spoon, uh, Food Rocket raises $2 million for 15 million grocery delivery in San Francisco. Tell us about what... What that two million, where that two million dollars goes, and, and what you're doing with that. 
Absolutely. So uh, this is such a unique opportunity that we have embarked upon. We really need to expedite our, uh, you know, our locations and and capturing more of the of the of the markets that we are in, expanding into further different markets. That is the number one priority, right? We should, uh, you know, we have this service. It's working really well in San Francisco. So hey, I'm pretty sure it's going to be working really well in all of the dense markets. So how quickly? Can we uh, go and you know establish new locations in different places? It's literally going to be that. Uh, we we the first mover advantage that you talk about, right? Uh, the reasons that companies such as Uber are successful is because of that first mover advantage. So so that's where the money is going. The money is going to establish more and more of these facilities, uh, refine our processes, build our engineering tools and technologies in a way that uh, you know we uh, are going to beat every single person who's going to come into this this space just because of the level of detail with which we are engineering all the different uh, steps of the processes inside our technology. So so that's where the money is going. Yeah. Where does uh, customer acquisition come into this process? Yeah, so good good point. So uh, once it's a good it's a good point. I think what we need to do is once once we establish all of these things and we can go inside, we do spend uh, some money in marketing as well to to just in the local neighborhoods to under, to to give the uh, you know uh, tell the consumers that we're ready and we're available for and and we do uh, simple local marketing sometimes even word of mouth sometimes facebook ads sometimes instagram like what people regularly do just to put the word out there that we're available once you have uh, you know even say if it's an apartment complex and you, you have one person you know that has ordered from the apartment complex and that service is awesome word of mouth spreads really quickly because now people see us on the streets, they see us uh, delivering to their apartment complex. They see our flyers out there. They see advertisements uh, appearing on their uh, on their uh, social media platforms. Uh, so we do spend some some uh, some marketing capital over there. But then I think we rely we rely a lot on word of mouth marketing. Uh, once once uh, you know we we are offering the quality of service that uh, you know uh, is true customer obsession. Right. So ad so advertising and, and and marketing is really about seeding the primary the the first point. And then Absolutely. the expectation is you have a great customer uh, experience. Yeah. And then those people tell their friends and family and their neighbors, et cetera. And now you have a big booming business based off of a, a seed uh, inspired by the marketing and advertising acquisition. Exactly, and and we do have, of course, the uh, you know first customer, first user, uh, you know, discount coupons and all those, those and things that we already are advertising. So when, when a person signs up and downloads our app, you know, their first three orders uh, have a twenty percent discount. So it's very easy for people to just you know start getting used to the platform. Uh, we have exceptional customer service, always available. So on chat, on text, on call, uh, always uh, available to guide you through a platform if needed or provide assistance if there's anything that you need while your order is being delivered to you or even after so. so when does this go national when when are we hearing about food rocket all across the country delivering a deep dish in chicago and uh or not not deep dish sorry you're doing groceries uh, there, you yeah. there you go. Yeah. Sorry. I'm thinking about pizza. <laughs> no, we I apologize. We, we will do a deep dish in Chicago. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that was that's definitely what I. So, we uh, we have a very good assortment. One thing, one unique factor about us is our assortment contains a lot of fresh produce. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, that is, you know, our, our competitors or anyone who wants to come into the space is definitely scared about because, you know, of, of the shrinkage and, and the spoilage that you they will see of, of fresh produce. So, we have around, I think, around 34% to 45% of our SKUs are fresh produce. Um, that is, you know, uh, like everything in season, everything that's locally sourced, organic, uh, you know, so we, we're definitely in that space and uh, we are definitely being, uh, you know, able to uh, scale that business model because we have such a large assortment of products, uh, you know. Uh, and so scaling nationally for us is is very soon. We are in the process of fundraising right now. Uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, raising our Series A capital, which is going to be in the double digit million dollars. Uh, and uh, we've got we've got some good traction. We've got some good investors that are lined up. And uh, you know, I think pretty soon you will hear us uh, going nationally with that funds that we've raised. You know, I I, as I think about this. I I often hear about food deserts. You know, places around the around the city that maybe don't have access to fresh produce. Seems like yeah. this would be a good opportunity to kind of create, create, create those opportunities for places that are, I guess, underserved. It, has that ever come across your business plan? 
Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think we, we don't intend to just serve one neighborhood. We intend to serve pretty much the entire city. So including the underserved neighborhoods as well. So like uh, we've just started. So we, as you say, as I, as I told you, we are, we are, you know, finding more locations. We're expanding, you know, as quickly as we can. Uh, and the idea is definitely to serve the entire city, whichever city we go into, we want to serve the entire city. We want to expand out even into the suburbs and the other areas as well. Uh, but I think, you know, you have to first leverage economies of scale in dense population areas and then you have to expand into the suburbs in in uh, in the same region uh, that you are so so we definitely are focused on on that and we will be serving the underserved communities as well yes very cool very cool um well jaron james thank you so much for being on our show today how can how can people find you yeah, they can uh, literally go to our uh, uh, the App Store and they can download Food Rocket app. Uh, it's available both on iOS and Android. That is where the order, order, ordering, the communication with the customer service agents, everything happens in one single platform. It's a very simple platform to use and uh, it's just three clicks to uh, deliver. Uh, and so very, very easy to use. And then we also are, uh, you know, looking for, uh, you know, talent to work with us for delivering as well as uh, for working inside our fulfillment centers. So we uh, definitely have the hiring page also up on our website that is foodrocket.me so foodrocket.me uh, and uh, so people can find us very easily on our website and the app and, and the apps on both the iOS and Android what, what types of people are you looking for like what's the right qualification yeah, excellent. So, so we're looking for people who are motivated, who have uh, some uh, experience delivering orders, uh, who are comfortable with, uh, you know, uh, taking orders on e-bikes and e-scooters. Uh, we are also looking for people that have inventory experience and, and uh, experience picking and packing. Uh, you know, uh, traditional e-commerce experience is absolutely good. Uh, we have micro fulfillment centers, and we have a complete uh, training manual and guidebook in which they can be trained within like 24 hours to 48 hours, and they can be ready to go. Very cool. Jaron James, COO and co-founder of Food Rocket. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for listening to this episode of the LA Business Podcast. If you like what we're doing on this podcast, please consider subscribing on Apple or Google Play, leaving a five-star review, and sharing with your friends. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for a guest you'd like to hear on this podcast, please email me, robert at brillmedia.co. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.